Good morning, everyone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome. Um, for those who might be visiting, I'm trying to, or new, I just want to mention the arrangements for you. We haven't got any really young children. Perhaps I don't need this announcement. But well, I was just going to explain about going out for creche, and creche is upstairs, and the rest of junior church is downstairs. But I think everybody who is here knows that already. Um, I do have a couple of other notices. One, whenever I do notices, it's always the day of community church at Sarnai. Um, so that's at three o'clock this afternoon, and Jan and Paul are going to be sharing um, their recent trip, about their recent trip, trip to Tikariad. And it says in my little note, illustrated with photographs and songs. So that sounds good. Um, now let me see. I have never done this before. I'm trying to use, I forgot my notes on the printer. So I'm trying to look at it on my phone, which is tiny. Um, I know that another notice, which I don't seem to be able to see on this right now. Let me just turn it around and see if I can see it that way is that it's ladies together uh, this Wednesday, is that right? Yeah, and it starts at 12 here. And I'm trying to remember the theme now from memory. Gratitude, gratitude, yeah. Um, another notice for you, actually, that's just come in. You'll remember the lovely ladies and the lovely work of Teen Challenge. Well, the ladies and staff are going to do a sponsored walk this week on Thursday. And the purpose of it is to raise funds um, so that they can go to a conference, Braveheart, is it? Conference at the end of May. Um, so Claire has asked if, if people will consider sponsoring them on their sponsored walk. And if you would like to do that, there's a sponsorship form at the front of the church, and I think there's one at the back as well, Claire. So if you feel led to support that event, please do sign up today to support them. Right. Was there any other notices, Mark? Bron, have I remembered them? The thing I wanted to share with you today, it was something that came from, um, that impacted me, that something Chris Frost shared on Palm Sunday. And that sermon had lots of goodness in it, as our sermons do. But um, there was one thing that made me think, oh, I've never thought that before. And it was when Chris said that um, Jesus wasn't modest. Because he said big things like, I am the creator of earth and heaven. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Big things he said about himself. And I thought, I'd never thought that. He was humble, but he wasn't modest. And I love how there'll be a little, some, a little bit of spiritual food like that on a Sunday. And then... You don't realise, you're just taking in this goodness, aren't you, like vitamins. And um, I was walking, as I often am, and thinking about, it was actually I was thinking about a work issue that I was wrestling with. And I thought about the fact that Jesus was the most amazing strategist, big picture person, the biggest picture, but he was also a tactician. He knew minute detail. And the problem I was wrestling, wrestling with, with work, stems from the nature of the job I have. So I would say I'm an in-between kind of person. I'm in between the university's senior staff and the people, um, the operational staff, what I would say the people on the front line, the coal face. I'm a project manager, so my job is to make new things happen, to help make new things happen, a lovely job. But what I find is that senior staff never understand the operational realities of the university. All the complexity of systems interlinked with each other, processes, procedures, um, the kind of heat map of the university in the course of a year, the different pressure points for different activities. And without doubt, they will always think a project can be done quicker than it can. And they will always think it's easier and more straightforward. Um, 
And then on the other side, I'll be talking to the people that I need normally to do something to help make this nice new thing happen. And they almost know too much detail. Oh, but if we do this, such and such will happen, and so and so will need to do something, and he's too busy, and they're doing that, and da da da. And before you know it, they've built up a case for either taking a very long time to do it or not doing it at all. So, um, I am the person in between that has to kind of interpret and translate, work out actually that's a real issue that needs resolving, that isn't, we can work around that one. Um, and, um, but but I, there was one thing that I'm working on at the moment and I was thinking, I need Jesus on this project team <laughs> because he understands both. Um, and I wanted to read, I'm hoping that I've got it now in my notes otherwise I have to go and grab my Bible. So it, yeah, it just struck me, I can't tell you how impossible it is to find a senior person. I mean, they're amazing people. In fact, one professor very knowingly said to me, Sue, he said, if I knew all those details, I couldn't do my job. I couldn't have the strategic vision. I couldn't do that senior leadership. Um, But there's, there's always this difficult thing I'm working around, almost tempering their expectations, making them realize it's going to cost a bit, it's going to take a bit longer. And the other's like, yes, we can do it, we'll get over the obstacles. Um, Jesus is both. So he knows, like, the biggest things about the world that scientists are still discovering day by day, but still don't know it all. But then he knows us like this, and I just wanted to read. It's a psalm I love. I love what's in this. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I love it because I often think when I'm like, oh, I'm caught in the middle here, and or wherever you're caught in a tight spot, and I think to myself, he knows. He knows what I'm dealing with, and that brings me comfort and reassurance. So it's, it's a bit of Psalm 39. Or is it 139? You'll know it when I start to read it. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we um, always have you near us and knowing us and seeing us. You see the really private battles that we fight and the more outward, external, public ones. You know the things that can trip us up. You know our stories intimately. And you love us through it all, Lord. Just pray today that we would remember that you are always for us. That nothing negative is of you, Lord. And that you're a God of solution possibilities, Lord. And just ask for a blessing on everyone here today as we worship you together and hear your word. Amen. Now let's see on my phone if I can... Okay. So um, we, we'll have our song next. Dave's going to lead us in prayer. And we'll then have a main song set. And during the first one, young people can go out. And during, the fir- or during that song set, not necessarily the first one, is it, Bron? But during the first song, if you want to give, there's an opportunity for the free will giver at giving. Alex is going to be bringing God's word to us today. Thank you, Alex. 
Um, so now I will just hand over to Steve and Gus. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Please stand and let's sing. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, this is not actually a book, it was a small piece called uh, Why Self-Denial, and he starts this with um, a verse from the Bible, Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, if anyone should come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, and Bonhoeffer goes on to, to say this, self-denial can never be defined as some profusion, be it ever so great, of individual acts of self-torment or of asceticism. It is not suicide, since there, too, a person's self-will can yet assert itself. Okay. Self-denial means knowing only Christ and no longer oneself. It means seeing only Christ who goes ahead of us and no longer the path that is too difficult for us. 
Again, self-denial is saying only he goes ahead of us. Hold fast to him. So with this in mind, uh, we turn to prayer. If you pray with me. Uh, Father, we find ourselves in a world that seems to try and grab our attention from, from every direction. We are required to walk along that narrow road that has so many turns, so many twists and bends, and yet, Lord, if we are to follow you, and to follow you only, we will stay on track, stay on that road, and uh, so easily we are pulled off by um, so many things that will tempt us. For um, many of us who are my age and older, we didn't contend with social media, we didn't contend with so many things um, on television telling us that we can be great, we can be our own people, we can be who we want to be, what we want to be. Lord, there was um, a time when we were all happy just to be fed, to do a good day's work, and to be able to just just be content with what we have and what you have given us, what we find in you. But um, Andy Warhol famously said something half a century ago that everybody will have their 15 minutes of fame. And we find ourselves now, Lord, in a world where everybody is clamoring for um, attention, whether it be uh, YouTube videos, whether it be just the way that they act, the way they live their lives. And uh, we even have people who call themselves influencers now who would influence people to dress a certain way, to act a certain way, and even as far as having cosmetic surgery that would uh, change the way we look. Lord, we, we pray for young people who we feel are particularly drawn to these situations because as youngsters, we all had to find our own identity to find out who we were, to find out um, our way in this world. And Lord, as we get older, thankfully, you have assured us of a path that is to follow you, to follow your ways is, is the way, not to follow the world. Lord, we were privileged um, some days ago to have the churches together to pray for Cardigan at um, New Life Church. And Lord, we thank you for that drawing together. You, you drew your people together in that place that we would pray for Cardigan, pray for our churches. And Lord, what a feeling of unity you gave us where we could just be together and be as one, just be as one people. And uh, although we thank you for the differences that there are in, in each individual church that uh, one may suit another, slightly um, suit somebody slightly more than another one would we thank you that we all have our place and can find a home in the church where we find ourselves um, Lord thinking again of um, the, the younger people the temptations uh, we think of uh, as we prayed at that meeting cardigan the surrounding towns the young people again looking for their way forward and finding so much um, so much that would tempt them to go off track. And so, Lord, we move on to the camp, the uh, green camp that will be coming up, being planned at the moment, that um, you would just guide your people to, uh, to organize this, guide the young people to be drawn to it, and bless them, Lord. We thank you again for what happened last year when the weather turned really bad, and yet you you, you stepped in and found a solution that sorted things out. And um, Lord, this, um, this year we pray would be different again. The weather we've had uh, recently has affected so many of us. We think of the farmers, I can't help but notice, as I'm sure we all can, the, the signs all around uh, that farmers have put out, no farms, no food. And um, with the wet conditions, I'm sure that um, this is extremely difficult, so we pray, Lord, for just a change in this, that um, farmers would be able to carry out their job and, um, and just supply the food where necessary. And lastly, Lord, I want to just pray this morning for the elders in Mount Zion Church. So often, they seem to quietly go around, go about their business, but Lord, we know full well that 
every time they have to reach into somebody's life to pray for somebody to, to help out, the effect it can have on them. So we pray protection over our elders and protection over Anth as he, the lead elder in the church, presides over this flock. We pray, Lord, that you would bless him with strength and energy. We pray that you would give um, Anth and Helen rest as they're away for this weekend, we pray. So, Lord, as we carry on with this service, we ask you to bless Alex, bless your word, and um, lead us on in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's stand and let's sing again. Um, you know, we're so privileged, aren't we? We are so privileged that we can come together and we can worship together. We can sing together in unison. And we can uh, direct our words and our thoughts um, towards God as we sing. And thank him for what he's done. Let's uh, stand and sing. and every day the things we take for granted forgive us lord and we thank you lord that you give us all we need and more and we thank you for this offering now and pray that you'd use it for your glory and your blessing in this area and further afield in jesus name amen Yeah. 
Good morning. I have this little clicker here. It's supposed to work. Who knows what that movie's from? Groundhog Day, yes. And who knows the name of the man? Phil Collins. And he's a weatherman, and every year he has to come to this rural hick town in Pennsylvania to cover Groundhog Day on February 2nd. And he absolutely hates it, and he's become very cynical about this old-fashioned tradition. And the people and really life itself. He's just on this, uh, this wheel going round and round. And he relives a day over and over again and it just gets worse and worse. Pretty soon he takes that clock and just smashes it on the, on the ground. And Stan, Stan and I were uh, discussing last week how uh, we're both rather skeptical people. Uh, we need facts, proof. We, we're not, we, we think we're not gullible. Well, most of the time we're not too gullible. But we like to know. And I, I, I was definitely... Uh, well, let me just say that being skept, skept, skeptical is not so bad, but it can easily turn into being cynical. And uh, when Rini, and not, Rini came to the Lord... Was I skeptical? You bet. And when I visited this commune, uh, well, wait, was I cynical? Yes, I was very cynical. When, we, when I visited this commune, the Lord's land, and all these Jesus freaks started telling me about how Jesus rose from the dead and he was alive. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, right. But then early in the morning, I went out into the Redwood Forest and I... I, um, I said, and I guess now I know it was a prayer, communion with God. If you're real, come into my life. Lightning bolts? No, nothing. But I had given it a go, but much to my surprise, later that day, I got born again. And maybe you have, uh, like me, maybe you have a, 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 a spouse who's very skeptical. Skeptical. I can't even say it. Skeptical. Right. You can see I'm a very accomplished speaker. And I saw, uh, you might be interested if you have someone like that. We saw a movie, it's called The Case for Christ. And I just, I got the book. It was so good. It was about... A chap named Lee Strobel, whose wife came to the Lord, and he was a uh, award-winning journalist for the Chicago Tribune, and he had to find out for his, her, himself about his wife's faith. And watching that movie, it reminded me so much of myself. Do you call? Do you recall Ant's message? Uh, a few weeks back when he said there were no attendees in the early church. I went back and I uh, looked back and it was uh, the 10th of March and I went to the website. You can hear it on the website or you can find the YouTube video. And he was preaching on Acts 2.41 to verse 47. And I, I sort of transcribed what he said because I thought it was so good. The church is pictured as branches in a vine, members in a family, brothers, sisters, mothers. 
It's pictured as stones in a building. It's pictured as parts of a human body. What are these images, what all these images have in common is that none of them allow for attendees. You can't be an attendee branch in a vine or an attendee member of a family. You can't have a brick that is an optional participant in a building or a visiting limb in a body. All these images that Peter, Paul, and Jesus used in the New Testament imply membership and involvement, a commitment to the local church. Attendee, well, that was me. We came to Mount Zion. I sat up in the balcony and often still do right up there. But we came when it was convenient. I did not want to get involved. I had seen enough in the church to be cynical. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Plus, I figured we had done enough. I'd read the Bible cover to cover, years in Bible college, had been a pastor, worked in a house reaching out to the herding, worked in a charity helping families with a disabled child. And then a new pastor came from Canada, and like Anth, our new minister, Rob, emphasized reading the Bible, and here again is our Mount Zion Church Bible reading plan that Anth put together. And I started reading the Bible again, and, but this time it was more than words, it was the Holy Spirit. Because I had drifted like a piece of driftwood, and if you're new in this church, you'll see right on, under that window, you'll see a, uh, this funny piece of wood, a piece of driftwood, and there's a story behind that. You'll, if you want to know, I'll tell you. And in Hebrews 2.1, it says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. Do you know anyone who's drifted away? Yeah, I know plenty of people have drifted away. And I realized I was drifting away. In our reading plan, we went by chapter and by chapter through the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote this letter. The author finishes the letter saying this is a word of exhortation. That word exhort is not a word we often use nowadays, but it means encourage. Not like, have a nice day, but stronger like urging on when you feel it is all too much. So when Anth asked the title of my message, I said, I thought, well, maybe this is a divine pep talk. You know that word? It's like the coach. It seems like in a lot of American sports, like basketball or the American football, have you seen this? They go like this to the referee, time out. And what do they do? They don't just say, okay, team, do your best. No, it's like, come on, you can do it. You might be behind, but you can do it. Rini had the coveted position of a cheerleader in her high school in America. I don't know if you've seen those in films, the cheerleaders. And their job was to get the crowd cheering their team to victory. But before we jump into Hebrews today, I'd like to read these verses from Psalm 92, verse 12 to 15. Rini and I are aware that we're on the last lap of our journey. I know some of you are too. And we re read these in our Bible reading the other day, and I think they'll encourage you like they did us. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in their old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He's my rock and there's no wickedness in him. Wow, produce fruit in their old age. There's not really any retirement. And here's a lovely photo of a, uh, a palm tree that you might see in a, a holiday brochure. 
And then here's another picture, a little video of other situations. The storms will come, won't they? And the palm tree has this amazing ability because it will, it's, it's a different kind than a regular tree. It will, it will flex in the storm. And God says, you'll be like that palm tree. When the storms come, you will kill, still keep standing. And then recently we had a, a number of storms. As you are, if you're from this part of Wales, you well know. And we had two big scotch pine trees. But because of all the rain, their roots just did not hold. And they were like this tree. They, they fell over. But the palm tree doesn't have rings, but if you notice these rings on a tree, some years they might grow more than others because of the season. Maybe it was wet, maybe it was more sunny, but they're always growing, aren't they? Until they die. They never stop growing. And let that be a lesson to us. I like these uh, versions, the NIV, because here's the same verse in the King James. It says, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be flat, fat, and flourishing. I don't like, know if I like that so much. But the other version says, they will be fruitful. They will stay fresh and green. Back to the letter of Hebrews, it seems to be addressing to Jewish believers, possibly in Italy, who are being persecuted for their faith. If you want a, a, a summary, the Bible Project has a great little video. The letter has many references to angels, many references to Old Testament scriptures, I think second only to Romans, which is much longer. And most of the first part of the letter, some think it's a sermon that's been transcribed, I don't know, but Jesus is better than the angels, better than Moses, a more superior priest. And rather, uh, and this mysterious priest, the king of Salem, the king of peace, Melchizedek, no longer sacrificed from the blood of animals, but once and for all by his own blood and sacrifice, Jesus. The second part is an exhortation to keep on going. The letter finishes saying, brothers and sisters, I urge, urge you to bear with a word of exhortation for in the fact I've written to you quite briefly. Briefly, this letter has 4,942 words. This is a bit corny, but do you know what this leafy vegetable is? Lettuce. There are 14 lettuce statements of exhortation in this letter. I remember the one in Hebrews 4. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Let us labor to enter into his rest. This morning we'll look at a few in the latter part of the letter. Hebrews 10, 19. There is no actually Greek word, I think, that says let us. I think, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but they've been added to, by the translators to emphasize the, the, the strength of these Greek verbs. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Draw near to God. It's not draw near to God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who, is, who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we, and let us consider 
how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. And then in Hebrews 12, 1, verse to verse 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Uh, on Easter Saturday, for the first time, uh, I ran the park run that's down at the uh, Wildlife Center. And Arian, uh, she uh, is a volunteer there, and has encouraged us to go. And I ran with perseverance. <laughs> As everybody passed me, because you go two loops, and these people are running way past me, and I, there I am at the end. And people are clapping. They say, come on, you can do it. I wasn't last. I think there were over 150 runners, because it was Easter, all these visitors. I think I was fifth from the last. But I did finish. But he says, let us run. Let us run the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, there will be times when you will get weary and you'll lose heart. But he says, keep on going. So you don't. And it's so important, isn't that, that encouragement. I think of uh, just what Sue said in the beginning about, you know, if you knew all the things that are happening, well, what if this happens, what if that happens? It's so easy to lose heart and you think, well, why even be, let's just quit altogether. If you've ever been in a building project, you know it always seems to be over time, more expensive than you think, and it just goes on and on. And sometimes you think, if I knew how, <laughs> how difficult this would be, would I start? But God sees, he just wants to encourage you. You know, if we saw our life, if uh, you could see all the struggles that you would have, would you just give up in the beginning? But he keeps encouraging you to go on and on and on. If you haven't met uh, Richard Sweetland, he's an older believer. Richard, do you want to come up here? Uh, he's um, probably younger than me, <laughs> I hope. Uh, he and his wife, Glennis, have come into uh, Mount Zion for a number of months now. And he's an example to me of someone who's going for it. Uh, like Caleb. Remember Caleb? He was one of the spies who didn't get discouraged. He saw it in faith. And when he finally entered the promised land, he was given and he said, give me that mountain. And I'm going to ask him uh, a few questions. And I... Yeah, thank you. Uh, what brought you to this part of West Wheels? Um, it's a long story, so I'm going to have to condense it, okay? Um, Glyn and I originate, Glynis is my wife sitting over there, we originate from Hertfordshire. And um, sadly, I lost my brother-in-law about five years ago, and it was a, a big old shock. And Glyn and I, we asked ourselves, um, what does God really want of us? And it was amazing that you showed the ground dog film there because that's where we were. We were sort of treading water and it's very easy to get comfortable. Uh, my brother-in-law was a Christian and we sort of, if I say we grew up together, uh, I love the guy. Anyway, um, my son, my middle son, retired from the army and moved to Pembrokeshire and Glyn and I were traveling backwards and forwards now and again in our camper, uh, visit, visiting him and staying here on holiday. And we fell in love with the place. Um, sideways to that, we also helped out in the church 
across the border from where we lived in Hertfordshire, in Bedfordshire. Uh, and we helped out with homeless folk and drug addicts and stuff. And I really, or we really noticed that there was a definitive need um, for people who mentor folk like that. They desperately need respite, um, a breather, basically. And um, so really, in our request in asking God what he wanted of us, we really felt over a long period of time and after sharing it with other Christian friends who we loved and who loved us, that um, a move to Wales could possibly provide um, an opportunity for us to um, buy a place that we could have people come and stay. And so basically the small holding that we purchased has all of those um, elements in it. Uh, we have people come and stay. Um, we're, we're intending to open that up to a wider um, church, fam the wider church family. Um, but people come and stay. They have hands on with the animals we got. And uh, they go home, recharge their batteries and crack on with mentoring again. So that's what we do, and that's why we came to Wales. Great, and uh, I bet you haven't had any challenges. <laughs> the weather, <laughs> the weather, yeah. Uh, and when did you give your life to follow Jesus? What brought you to that point? Um, I was one of those people that felt that they were a Christian. Uh, I felt that I didn't need to go to church. In fact, it was great when Glynis went off to church because I could crack on and do what I wanted to do. And I knew that I had two, two hours free to myself to be able to do what I wanted to do. I was one of those people that kept God in a box. Uh, I only got him out when I needed him. At the time I was in the fire service and I clearly remember driving on nights and you know, my car uh, on my own saying, oh God, would you look after Glyn and the kids? And um, one particular day I... Um, I was on a, a common, I had a part-time job looking after a common. And I've always loved dogs. Uh, in my early part of my life, dogs were a big thing for me. And I had one particular dog called Flint. He was a lurcher. And um, by necessity, I used to go out uh, lamping with him. And uh, you would call that poaching today. And um, I used to go on land where I shouldn't be. And uh, we used to get, I used to get rabbits and... Flint was, uh, he was my outlet, basically. And unfortunately, somebody thought that they had more right to him than I did and uh, that he was stolen. And my world just collapsed. Um, a family man, you know, I love my family very, very much indeed, but somebody nicked my dog. <laughs> um, and I wasn't a happy chappy. Well, that particular day, I went down on the common because that was part of my job. And... Um, there was nobody else there. I was completely on my own. And um, it was seven o'clock in the evening, on a June evening. It's a lovely evening. And I got out of the car, and I walked for about 200 yards. And I just, in my own way, I said, oh God, why have you, <laughs> why have you um, taken this dog from me, you know? What's, what's that all about? And um, from that point on, I. I find it very difficult to describe. I did not hear a voice, but I felt this overwhelming presence. It was, I mean, stood here, I'm just covered in goosebumps, and that's how I felt on that day, or that evening. And um, I didn't get an answer, but I just knew it was not my own. It was the really weirdest feeling that I've ever had in my life. I'd met a woman about two weeks before, a lady called Anne Evershed who delighted in telling me that she was a Christian. I thought she was a mad woman. And I thought, I'm going to avoid this woman like the plague. But I, I uh, felt after that episode on the common, or that, that sort of sense on the common, this thing inside me saying to go to see Anne Evershed. And I did. And I was broken. I was, I was like... In I had tears in my eyes. I was like this, you know, fireman, supposed to be out of coat with stuff. Yeah. And um, I knocked on a door and there was no answer. I mean, there was, <laughs> I didn't get an answer. I wasn't expecting that one. So I went home and uh, 
I walked in the door and Glynis immediately said, oh, what's the matter with you? She said, what's happened? So I told her. She said, oh, I don't think God uh, you know, wants you to have dogs. I could have throttled her. <laughs> I could have throttled her. That's not what she should have said. <laughs> anyway, um, as life went, as time went on, um, I sort of got over that. But my life changed dramatically. I felt in the, in the fire service, I, I just didn't need to swear anymore. And, um, but I was very careful not to alienate myself because it's very easy to do that and become more righteous than thou. I was still the same Richard Sweetland, but I had a different way of thinking about things. And I remember God in my, I remember him sort of running after me and I know that's the only words I can say as a new Christian, but that's my story. That's what happened to me. Great, Great. thank you very much. And is there a scripture that has a, a special importance to you? Scripture, yes. It's Ephesians 2, where God's, uh, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's my favourite go-to. That really spoke to me all those years ago. But if you back up into chapter 1, there's a verse in there that says that he, he created us at the beginning of time. So that takes us back to Genesis. Yeah. So I'll say to all of you, that if you just grab hold of that, that God knew you and had you in mind at the beginning of time or even before the beginning of time, that you would be born in a time like this. Grab hold of that because that's big, isn't it? And if that doesn't get you on your knees, you've got a real problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do you have uh, uh, hopes for this year? Uh, hopes. Well, we joined you guys at the same time as Ants joined. Um, I mean, Glyn and I think of that as just not a coincidence. And we've been going through um, Acts, the Holy Spirit. And my hope and desire would be that the Holy Spirit blows through this place. That it blows through the churches here in Cardigan. That each of us will know what our calling is, that we won't be having a ground dog day, that we can, we can do stuff that God wants us to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Richard and Glennis, how you brought them here. You gave them a vision. And... Um, we pray you bless them and thank you for that word of encouragement that you saved him and opened his eyes and, and I'm sure Glance was very patient at times. And bless them, we pray, that vision for this uh, helping others in this small holding. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Could we all stand together now? And this at the end of the letter of Hebrews is a, a benediction. Shall we read it together? Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equipped you with every good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And uh, afterwards, uh, Stan and Sue will be available to pray in the back if you'd like prayer, if anything spoke to you today or if you have a need. Bless you.
today will have nothing like the Groundhog Day that that character had, but we will each of us draw near to God, hold unswervingly to the hope that we have, and run with perseverance as we deal with the rubs and challenges of life, so that we can do the good things he's got planned. Amen. And please stay for refreshments, either coming out or some will be brought in. Thank you. <laughs> 